Coming up on Regarding Men, So You Say You Want Equality. Welcome to Regarding Men, where we hold men in high regard and where red pill isolation comes to die a quick death. Indeed, I'm joined today by my usual compatriots, Paul Elam from paulelam.com and Janice Fiamingo of the Fiamingo Files, two of my two favorite men's advocates. And today we're going to be talking about, so, you think you want equality? Hmm. Yeah, that's what they think. And we're going to be talking about two very contrasting views of what this equality thing is all about, this gender equality thing. Hmm, what is it about? And we're going to be contrasting what regarding men thinks about gender equality and what the UN feminists think about gender equality. And the two are very different kinds of opposing viewpoints. <laughs> And we're going to start off talking about what happened uh, recently with a gold mine, an explosion in a gold mine, which trapped a number of men in that mine. And we're going to go on after that and talk about something created by the UN women about their view of gender equality. So let's, let's start with the um, mining story, and let's see if we can find just where that guy is. There it is. China Mine Rescue, 11 miners brought to surface alive. Okay, that's good. That's good. But guess what? You read through this article, and what do you find? You find they never mention women, and they never mention men. They just talk about miners. What does that do when, when people avoid saying men and only talk about minors. What do you think, guys? What does that do? Well, it, according to the headline, at least the the mine, it appears that the mine was rescued. Uh, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, uh, but this is, you know, this is standard fare. And I can assure you uh, that if one of those rescued had been a woman, that would have been in the headline and it would have been repeated in the story throughout. And we see this over and over again throughout the years. They say uh, 10 miners rescued or 10 people killed, including one woman. Uh, 10 <laughs> yeah. people rescued, including one woman. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody farted, <laughs> including a woman. <laughs> no. Uh, no. <laughs> Not in that case. <laughs> oh, me. No, Which probably not in that case, but it is it's standard journalistic procedure that when men are imperiled or killed or placed in danger, they become their professions. They are miners, they are construction workers, they are law exactly. enforcement, they are soldiers, uh, they are any number of different professions, but they're not him, right. and they're not he, and they're not men. Right. Because that would humanize exactly. the people who are affected. Exactly. And we can't have men humanized in a society that depends on men's sacrifice. Yes. So what we're seeing in, in journalism is a reflection of that. We have to keep men dehumanized in order to keep tolerating them being dead. And of course, we can't tolerate women being injured, killed, or, or anything like that. That's why you see when there's... 25 men killed and one woman killed, they're going to say 25 oil workers were, were killed or 26, including one woman. Yeah. Um, because yes. that is really bad. It's, yes. it's yeah. bad when women die. Uh, and apparently, according to our media, men don't die, but minors do and <laughs> other professions do. But men, no, mm -hmm. they apparently live forever. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's a, you couldn't get a clear illustration of, I think, Warren Farrell's expression that men are human doings rather than human beings. And you couldn't have a clear illustration of the fact that any time 
the context would seem to provoke some kind of empathy or concern for human vulnerability, the gender of the men is just screened out of the discussion. They become gender neutral people. The only time men's sex is emphasized is when they're doing something bad, when they're per the perpetrators of evil, then of course their sex is very, very much placed at the foreground. It's uh, really remarkable. I mean, even when the um, you know studious need to de-emphasize the male humanity of these, these workers, uh, even when that studious need leads to very awkward prose, as if we move to the next screen, we can see, and Tom, I know you highlighted for us, every single time the report uses minors when you would have expected it would use men in some of those places. I mean, it, it's at least a so awkward and strange. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's yeah. It, it, if you read it out loud, it's truly bizarre. And if these had been women in a similar kind of situation, of course, there is no way that their sex would have been de-emphasized and hidden. There's no way that their profession would have been emphasized over their female humanity. I mean, it's just crazy. TV footage showed the first minor who is blindfolded to protect. If they could have found a gender you, uh, neutral pronoun <laughs> instead of his eyes, they would have put it in there. If they could have left out the, the, the gender pronoun altogether, they would have done it for sure. Yep. Blinded to, to protect the eyes from the light or something like that. I wouldn't have been surprised to see that being lifted out as emergency workers cheered. The fate of 10 other minors remains unknown as rescue operations continue to try to locate them. The entrance tunnel to the Hushan gold mine in Shandong province collapsed after an explosion on the 10th of January. A total of 22 minors were trapped in the blast, the cause of which is unknown. At least one died and it's still not known if the remaining workers are alive underground. The first minor was brought to serve. Never, never men. I mean, it is just, it's remarkable. The studious indifference to their male humanity. Yes, and as and much- And you can bet if, if there were a woman in the mix there that had been trapped, there would be a see this other article on the special plight of, of women minors. Yeah. They would have done a background story on that and so maybe two yeah. or three of them. Oh, and goodness. famous female miners throughout history and, and yeah. women who have sacrificed. So they would have yeah. done that. They would. Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Famous oh, female miners whose lives have been lost in their oh, valiant God, work so to true. bring us all a better standard of living or whatever it would happen to be. Absolutely. That yep. would be foregrounded. <laughs> and the bottom line is they're marginalizing men. As yeah. much as feminism yaks and yaks about, oh, marginalize this and marginalize this population, this population is marginalized. Forget about looking at marginalization of men. That doesn't even mm -hmm. exist. They don't give a crap about it. That's exactly yeah. what's going on here. Men are yeah. getting marginalized. Yeah, it's just, it is extraordinary. It really wow. is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember reading an article, and I'll, I'll um, include it in the link below so that anybody can look at it. It's an excellent article. It was written um, way back in 2015 by a guy named Glenn Poole. And it's called, now I forget the exact title, it's something like nine out of 10 deaths in uh, police custody or male. Who cares? And he goes through the mechanisms of this dehumanization of men and the marginalization of, of, of men in any case where empathy might be evoked, right. where in any case where they might be shown as vulnerable, as suffering, as, as being killed, being um, you know made to feel pain, etc. The only time he says that they their sex is foregrounded is when they're bad and when they're the perpetrators of some kind of harm, especially harm to women, then of course their sex is foregrounded. And it's, you know, this is a perfect illustration of it. Yes, same thing, only different. Yeah. So uh, should we move on to the Yeah, so let's UN? move on. Let's mm -hmm. see yeah, what we've Yeah, keeping that in mind. <laughs> but I want to warn everyone, put on your seatbelt, because this is definitely <laughs> um, one that is difficult. And there it is, there's the, uh, UN Women, welcome to Equaterra, where gender equality is real. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, sure. and the UN Women, I mean, 
I don't even know anything about this organization. I just know it's it's you know it's one of the bodies of the United Nations that is tasked with well, it's given a whole bunch of money uh, in order to put in place programs and policies all all around the world, allegedly to bring about gender equality and to help girls and women. And it's um, gynocentrism is unabashed and overt. It's um, assumption that in every sphere of human endeavor and human life, men are privileged, men are cosseted, men are powerful. Women, on the other hand, of course, are vulnerable and hurting and you know need to be aided. Uh, that is simply assumed. It's never argued for. And I mean, this thing that they have put together, this imaginary world that I guess the UN is supposed to work towards, all our money is supposed to go to fund this utopian dream of the UN Women Organization. Uh, this, um, it would be risible, it would be laughable and ludicrous if it were simply made by you know some women's organization somewhere, but considering the might of the UN and that this is what our money is going towards. I find it a terrifying vision that disappears men and their needs and imagines um, just you know endless money to be used to advantage women, and um, ha you know has absolutely no grasp on gender reality whatsoever. Yeah, I think there were like 23, 24 gendered agencies of the United Nations, all of them for women, uh, uh, different agencies that are working to right. create this utopia. And, and you know, it, it, it's probably fitting. The UN has been pushing for imaginary worlds for a long time. And I think this just more or less just follows through with their long time mission. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the way they announce it. We found a country that has achieved gender equality. Oh, they made up a country that they're claiming as gender equality. But as we will see when we dig into this, they do not have gender equality, or that is not the aim at all. It's the aim only, is to privilege women. It's only yeah. about women and girls. Yeah. Women and girls feel safe when walking at night. Hmm. Yeah. Well, do the boys yeah. and men feel <laughs> safe? I know that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, like they and I mean, more feel, often. yeah, feel <laughs> safe for one thing. Like, who cares what? I mean, well, I guess we care in some way what people feel. But let's talk about reality. Yeah, I just did. I was just doing research on on uh, homicides in Canada, and mm. men die at to three times the number that women die in an average year. So let's not talk about whether women feel safe or not. Let's talk about the reality of working to make all people safe and acknowledge the fact that men are the ones who are most at risk on the yes. streets yes. of our cities. Men are... who obviously don't understand equality. <laughs> yeah. It yeah, has I nothing mean, to do with men. Oh boy, it really doesn't. It's, it's just, yeah, it's incredible, you know. Um, uh, you know, let, let's let's just read through it and look at a few of the. This is sort of their overall picture, and yep. and it's just remarkable the things that are left out, such as the fact of gold mine disasters, of uh, the one in instance that we just looked at. Uh, totally ignored is the reality of the um, you know occupational fatality gap, uh, the, the gender death gap, the empathy gap. Uh, the gap in in uh, skills attainment at universities. Uh, you know, there are so many areas in which men are lagging far behind women, in which women are privileged, in which it's obvious that around the world people care more for women, and none of that reality is acknowledged here. So what they talk about, yes, is um, women and girls feeling safe when walking at night. They get paid <laughs> equally as men yes. for work of equal value and there is the word of course oh value who oh decides what is the work of equal value why does well, it have to happen suggestion along those lines uh -oh. is that for instance a, a receptionist is of equal value to a neurosurgeon <laughs> and as long, as, as long as we accept that premise and premises similar to that 
then we can maintain the equality narrative and the equal valuing narrative throughout this conversation. You just mm -hmm. have to understand that, you know, babysitters are every bit as mm -hmm. important as university professors and uh, doctors and attorneys. And should but, be paid accordingly. Like, yes, yeah. they should. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and it all, it, it often seems to happen when they're talking about work of equal value, that the work that the women have chosen in this case, and I don't know if they'd go as far as you, Paul, in saying that, you know, a receptionist is a, a doing work of equal value to a surgeon, but they would say, well, but the receptionist is doing work of equal value to the uh, janitor or something like that. Yeah. But it just so happens that the work that they claim that is of equal value, but in which the male uh, worker is getting paid more than the female worker. It just so happens that that male worker works uh, more difficult hours, works at a dirty, often dangerous job, uh, is not sitting down all day in a comfortable, you know, well-ventilated room in a comfortable chair, but is in fact, you know, dealing with toilets and garbage and sewage and, you know, all sorts of unpleasant things. And that there are reasons why women are choosing not to do that kind of work and reasons why that very necessary work is paid more highly than the other work that is being chosen by women. And, you know, the refusal to acknowledge that basic fact of human choice and the different gendered choices that men and women make just, you know, makes this, uh, yeah, an exercise in um, crazy making utopianism in which endless money is thought to exist to reward the work that they decide should be rewarded more generously. Right. It's never made clear how uh, all of their dreams um, and you know, perfect solutions will be paid for, how the massive tax burden that would be required to make that possible is to be borne, while at the same time, you know, they're imagining men and women working fewer hours and spending much more time home with their children and being paid by their employers to stay at home and, you know, all of these different things. None of that is ever addressed in any kind of serious way. The idea is simply that if we will it, we can make it so. And, crazy, and you got to admit, in Equiterra, we do not need to factor away variables that compare income. I mean, it's come on, folks. It's really simple. Either she makes as much as him or not. And if you want to throw in things like that, he's like injured on the job all the time and he's under constant threat and danger. I mean, you're just cluttering this up with irrelevant information. If she's yeah. not making that money sitting behind the desk, answering the phone every four and a half minutes, uh, if she's not making the same as somebody that is, I don't know, say, uh, lifting up cars <laughs> and tearing down engines and things like yeah. that. Uh, again, you're confusing the important issues here. Equiterra does not recognize different variables when it comes to employment. How else, yeah. how else would it be equal? There mm -hmm. you go. There so let's go. look at number yeah. one. Yeah. Here we go. Let's see. There's number one. Now, the, what the UN women did was they made this big mural. And we're going to be looking at different segments of that mural. And so you'll see one segment here that they called Unstereotype Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And supposedly we still live in a world in which gender stereotypes operate to constrain what little girls can imagine they might become when they grow up into Correct. adults. Of course. Yeah. So, you know, this is the whole idea. Oh, gee, if you ask a little girl walking along on Stereotype Avenue what she wants to be when she grows up, she could tell you I can be anything. A scientist, an engineer, a Supreme Court judge, an Olympic champion, an artist or astronaut, not even the sky is the limit when it comes to dreaming big. The yeah. word stereotype has lost its meaning in this country. People root for the girl who wants to be a professional football player, not question her capabilities, and teachers encourage all of their students to choose STEM fields instead of assuming that girls wouldn't be interested in them. <laughs> I mean, what do you say about this nonsense? I say one thing. 
I didn't see the word boy any place. No, <laughs> no, because it's assumed, of course, that boys are encouraged to do everything when we know that in, in uh, you know, the vast majority of public schools today, the vast majority of teachers are gynocentric women who think it is part of their task as teachers to give special encouragement and special consideration to their female students and to ignore the boys or to see them as problems uh, and even to give girls higher grades. Oh, no. There have There's been there. studies done about the fact that that is, is, is part of what is going on in schools today, accounting for the greater dropout rate of boys. Yeah. So that the problem that we have today is the exact opposite. And of course, is, is caused by this narrative of female disadvantage and the need to encourage and empower girls. Yeah. It's horrific. And I love this added thing in here that they celebrate diversity and equitary uh, Equiterra, not, it's not feared because as we all know, we all really fear diversity. Nobody, uh, everybody's terrified of that, but I'm glad they recognize that. I mean, this is honestly unstereotype. Is that even a word? No. It is yeah. today. I mean, it, it, it's, it's so silly pretending that there is a problem that hasn't existed for at least the last 60 years. I went to school exactly. starting in the 1970s. I was told from day one exactly this, that I could do anything I wanted to do if I had the skills, of course. I mean, I appreciated my teachers and my parents for making that an important caveat. If I was willing to do the work and put in the hours and defer gratification, as the phrase goes, and, you know, how, if I had the talent, I mean, I just love this. Teachers encourage all of their students to choose STEM fields. Well, why would you do that if your students don't have have the the, the capability, the intellectual chops, and the uh, the drive and the determination and the conscientiousness to excel in a STEM field? Why would you encourage them to go into something that they're not going to be able to make a contribution to? But of course, that assumes that there are actual differences between individuals, not necessarily necessarily between the sexes, but just between individuals in terms of ability and, you know, intellectual capacity. But, you know, that is not to be talked about either. Well, besides, they've been encouraging women for 25, 30 years vigorously now to go into the STEM fields, and they don't want to. Why not? They don't do it. Why don't they? They make different choices. Exactly. With they their don't lives. want to. And they do, I mean, to some degree, we're talking about a difference in aptitudes, but let's assume that everybody has the same aptitude. Women make different choices, yeah. many of which revolve around lifestyle and, mm -hmm. and comfort of living. And I think that speaks to women's intelligence. Yes. I, 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 do what they I wish I'd made different choices sometimes that, that really facilitated an easier life for me. But mm -hmm. it's like what they're saying is, to women with this is that what you want doesn't matter. Here's what you're supposed to do. Right. It's it's it's, ridiculous. The, it's the, the yeah. biggest Crazy. stereotyping you can possibly imagine. Exactly. And I'm sure they'll make really good money because you know the currency in Equaterra is unicorn glitter shits. That's what you <laughs> exactly. to, to buy things with. And yeah. they manufacture that by the bucket full. Oh man, they do. The they do and they well, get... and you know and the actual fact is that um that women are going into specific STEM fields. In fact, um, Mark Perry has found that in the field of biology, for example, women are far outpacing men as right. graduates from university with degrees in biology. So that's one of the STEM fields that women are very, very interested in. If you include medicine as a STEM field, uh, which traditionally has been done. Well, women are, there are more women graduating as with degrees in medicine than, than men nowadays. So, so, you know, women are surging forward in that profession too, with serious consequences actually, because women don't tend to want to work the same hours as doctors. They're certainly not prepared to move to small towns and rural areas where doctors are desperately needed. They're not as prepared as, as men are. And that's partly because they know they have options that 
men don't tend to have. They can themselves marry a doctor who is going to earn a very good salary by working those extra hours. And then they can cut back and, and have a nice profession, but a much more um, you know livable work-life balance. I mean, women just have more choices. Yep. And uh, so, you know, it, like none of this is true. Uh, it doesn't correspond to reality. The only areas in which men uh, significantly, um, you know, outpace women uh, it seemed to be now engineering and a few of the very hard natural sciences like chemistry and physics, physics. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. where there's it's really numbers based. And that does seem to reflect the different interests as well as aptitudes of men and women. It certainly has nothing to do with whether women are being encouraged to do things or not dependent on stereotypes. I mean, you know, this like the thinking is so antiquated and it covers over a bias against boys and men that's yes. really very worrisome and, of course, is just simply wrong. Yes. I've never seen such strong blinders, you know, where people simply yeah. cannot see anything outside of this little teeny field of vision. And that's what you see. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, if we'll we can see. bear it. I was going to say, what's the next one? <laughs> I'm getting mad. Violence-free yeah. uh, alley. Yeah. Oh, good. Violence free alley. So this is just more of this nonsense <laughs> that women are, are the victims of violence more often than than men. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and, and the way the only way they can make that even remotely credible is to count as violence all sorts of things that are not violence, such as what they call sexual harassment, which of course can be anything from, you know, a, a man commenting on how he likes a woman's new hairstyle at work, uh, you know, to asking her out for coffee a couple of times, perhaps too persistently when she isn't actually interested in going out for coffee with him, you know, all the way to cat calling on the street, or, or what have you, all, all of which are certainly, I mean, some of them might be mildly unpleasant if you don't like being catcalled. A lot of women do enjoy it, but if you don't happen to like it, it's un mildly unpleasant, but certainly doesn't compare to being beaten or killed as you're, as you're walking home from work, as happens yeah. to men. Yeah. yeah. It's just nonsense crazy, yeah crazy. i mean and it, you know it's even made clear here they aren't taught to walk with their keys between their fingers in case they're attacked okay well that is serious if indeed women face that as a as a major issue in their lives i think most women don't in in most towns and cities across north america but okay yes if some do that's a terrible fear but then notice how that's linked to or worry about being judged for the clothes they wear. Oh, how terrible. I've been judged. I, I wore a skirt that was short and somebody judged me. I mean, I don't know. You know, it's just like, as you said, Tom, the, the blinders, the determination to find everything in a woman's life, no matter how trivial or even pleasant, uh, you know, a, a source of grievance is just, it's amazing. It's, it's astounding. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Only women have problems. Men yeah. don't. Yeah, which yeah. makes me wonder when I'm looking at that image, uh, I guess in Equaterra, they don't have problems because everybody is, is happy and wonderful. So why do they need support services that Ooh. are on that one building? What, what <laughs> on, on earth could possibly wrong That's in Equaterra point. that somebody would need some additional help? Oh, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do say, I, I thought that was an interesting thing. At the bottom, they say domestic violence is a rare occurrence. So there it is, Paul. It's rare, but it oh. does happen occasionally still. And, 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 and notice. Because there against it. And because yeah, as if there are now. Unlike, unlike here, where, where yeah. it's legal to beat your it's wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and encouraged, of course, Paul. Yes, encouraged. yes. Yeah. and rewarded. Yeah, of and, and of course. course, we have no services to support victims, i.e. female victims. Right. It's true that we don't have any services or very, very few to support male victims of domestic violence. And in fact, those victims are liable to be arrested and charged 
if they call the police to report the violence against yep. them. Uh, so yes, it's true. We don't have gender equality when it comes to domestic violence, but that is not on the minds of the foolish women who, who are creating these images in this text. Yeah, I like, there's no such thing as femicide. Women are valued yeah. and respected. So I wondered to myself, well, is there such thing as homicide? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and there is no such thing as femicide. I mean, what a bizarre thing. Like femicide is just a made up term that to, to, to yeah. um, you know, to prioritize. Much like Equipera itself. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's, it's just a, it's a made up idea. Yeah. It's supposed to denote that women are being killed because they are women. Right. And that that somehow makes their deaths more awful and more regrettable, regrettable. Whereas when men are killed, that's not, you know, a special kind of gendered crime. That's just ordinary killing. They weren't killed because they were men. They right. were just killed. And so therefore their deaths are not as regrettable. And that's what feminists use in order to cover over the fact that men, many more men are killed every year yes. than are women. I mean, wow. And the talk about the-, well, the Maybe we could change the name to equicide. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever's killed, it's an equicide. Because in Equaterra, everything's equal. That's right. Yeah. Just like yeah. the real world. And no one mm -hmm. gets killed. Are we ready for the um, next one? Yeah. Well, let's see what the next one is. Oh, Equal Pay Street. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they're do knocking down workplace discrimination there in the back, and you can see the glass ceiling is there in a little big tub. Wow. Oh, yes, it's been broken. Oh, yes, yeah. it's mm -hmm. broken. It's yeah. gone. Yeah. Equal work and equal pay. And, of course, that myth was busted up how many years ago now did Warren write that book? Jeez. Late 70s, was ago. it? Yeah, I and don't, yeah. 15 and years, maybe? It was even destroyed in Forbes, for pity's sake. I mean, they, they, <laughs> this has been one of those zombie ideas that yeah. that doesn't even surrender to a headshot. It's been totally destroyed over and over and over again for years. But you can't tell that to the, anybody who wants to believe that women are getting shorted in their paychecks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they talk about systemic barriers. I don't even know. You know, I was thinking, what is a systemic barrier? Like it's a it's a it's a nonsense phrase. It, it implies that there's something built into the system. But what would that be? I mean, it's illegal to pay a woman less than you pay a man for the same work. It's been illegal since oh I don't know I, in the 1960s. I think that law came in. Right. Uh, right. It's illegal and, to and discriminate. It never was a real practice to begin with. Correct. Uh, employers never really discriminated much against women in one in, in terms of pay uh, uh, because they couldn't compete with each other if they did right. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 I mean obviously if you could pay a woman less for the same work then you would hire you know women. employers would be delighted and would no hire all would women and jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there did used to be discrimination, um, but it was a different kind of discrimination. It was based on whether you were married or not. Mm -hmm. And so a married man often got a pay raise uh, over a single man because it was understood that he was having to support a family. But I don't know, you know, when that practice um, died out. I don't really know much about it. But uh, yeah, this notion that uh, employers paid women less just out of some kind of discriminatory attitude and that there is still, um, I mean, it's, it's so it's the exact opposite again, you know, in, in law firms across the country, uh, in many other kinds of big corporations, the, the discrimination works in favor of women because um, these big companies want to be able to promote themselves as progressive and feminist uh, and, and, you know, to show off the way in which they have promoted women to the highest levels. And so if you're a woman who is interested in putting in the work, you're in a very good position. And, but again, you know, we have to keep pretending that it isn't so and pouring more money into various kinds of programs that advantage women. Yep. Crazy, crazy. Number four. Number four. Yeah. I think this is my favorite. 
Yeah, this is the best. This is my favorite toxic masculinity recycling plant. Holy <laughs> macro, they're going to fix toxic masculinity. And here's yeah. a tip off. Look at what they're dumping into the tub that goes into the recycling plant. And if you look closely, it says, girls are weak. Okay, <laughs> here's a clue. Okay. Girls are weaker than boys mm. by a long shot. A little boy at 12 years old, his upper body strength quadruples, quadruples. Young boys who are 13, 14, 15, have a huge amount of upper body strength. They're much stronger than girls. And yes, girls are weak in comparison. Period. That's a fact. That's not a that's not a question. So they're pouring it in. It girls are weak. Oh, pour it in the toxic masculinity recycling bin. And then the next one and is I find that the, uh, and one more comment on that. I find that particularly ironic <laughs> given the amount of infantilization that, that comes from feminism. Uh, yeah. infantilizing women, making them weak, making them snowflakes, making them offended at every remark that mm -hmm. is ever uttered around them, <laughs> making them cry because they didn't run IBM by the time they were 22 <laughs> and the patriarchy that stopped them. Um, oh, yeah. If, if they should have a feminist dumping that into the bin uh, mm -hmm. if they want to correct the problem. Exactly. Yes. Remember the article we looked at um, for our last episode about the uh, 24 people who had been found in Sweden. It's an old story, but right. back in 2011, I think right. 24 people were found in this pedophile ring and uh, or child pornography ring. And uh, and the 23 women who were not put into prison as compared to the one man who was. And the reason they weren't put into prison was that they were not well-balanced individuals. In other words, they were all weak and had been preyed on by this one man. I mean, you know, so there it is. Yes, it's, that's, that's a feminist and, of course, a gynocentric assumption that takes away agency from women and yep. means that we should treat them far more leniently when they do yep. bad things. Yep. <laughs> So maybe that one should like, be Like we do with all strong people that we hold in high regard. <laughs> <laughs> and the second bag they put in there is men don't cry. Mm -hmm. Men don't cry. Well, I got news for you guys. You know, testosterone limits men's emotional tears. So men don't cry as much as women. Period. The end. Finish. And it's for Not only reasons. that, there's something in the tear ducts themselves that are larger in men yes, than they are in women. That's right. And and it takes more tear production to make a tear spill out of a male eye exactly. than it does a female eye. Yes. <laughs> and the fact is, you know, this is something that I I always has just been a big bone of contention with me with the psychological community. <laughs> Just get over it. Men don't process emotions in the same way, on average, that women do. We don't. We handle things differently. I'm with you. And yes, men cry sometimes. And right. I don't know any men that are embarrassed at having cried. I mean, right. this whole myth about that we're terrified of showing a tear to the world is bullshit. It always has been bullshit. Uh, Men are taught to master their feelings, and that is a good thing. It's a productive thing. It's a yes. maturing thing in yes. human beings. Mm -hmm. yes. And feminists are such morons, they want to throw that out. And they think mm -hmm. that that's a path to equality, right. to make men yeah, well, like women. That's what the and women, goal is. you know, let's let's do it. I say, you know, women should be taught to control their emotions too. No. I'd like to see fewer displays of oh, female God. emotionality. It would certainly make the workplace a better place to be. I would like to see fewer women's marches in which women whip themselves up into hysterical frenzies over their, you know, perceived grievances. And in general, yeah, I'd like, I'd love to see women controlling their emotions more. So let's talk about toxic femininity then, if we're going to get into this kind of name calling and, and slurring of, of, you know, entire classes of people. And let's talk about relational aggression and let's talk about manipulativeness and oh, let's talk yeah. about gossip and all the ways yeah. in which women tear at the fabric of communities and harm one another and themselves. 
um, you know, because of their um, particular ways of being in the world. It's, yeah, it's, it's just, I mean, it's so need horrible. We're going to a bigger trough by the time Janice is through. I'm telling I mean, you. There's not going to be near enough room for the, all the garbage. And she's absolutely right. If oh, yeah. women were more in control of their emotional lives, we wouldn't have feminism. That's it wouldn't even exist. Sure. That's a good mm -hmm. point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. The third bag is men should be aggressive. They're going to put that into the toxic masculinity plant and recycle it. Men mm -hmm. should be aggressive. Well, I got news for these people. You know, they're safe. They have a nice safe place to sleep at night because of aggressive men. You know, mm -hmm. men who are not afraid yeah. to stand up and say, no, you're not doing that. The sociopaths stand down because these strong men have stood up. And without mm -hmm. those strong men being aggressive, you'd be up Shit's Creek without a paddle. Mm -hmm. so, but I wonder, will they need that in Equaterra? Because apparently <laughs> nothing bad ever happens there because they there have you go. instructed men to not be aggressive. There um, you go. I don't know how that adds up, but apparently it does in oh, the mind of God. the ideologues. And the last yeah, I love. Is... Go ahead. James. I love the sentence where they um, where they express how this is all going to come about. It's in that second paragraph there, the second sentence in the toxic masculinity recycling plant through innovative dialogues and learning. Toxic behaviors are transformed into attitudes that perpetuate gender equality. I think they meant perpetrate, but anyway, um, you know, whatever that means, innovative dialogue. Is that what we've been having over the last 60 years of feminism? Has that oh, been boy. innovative dialogue? Feminists screaming oh, yeah. at men that they have to stop being so toxic and being told that the way they stand, the way they sit on subways, the way they explain things, that it's all wrong and it all has to be changed. Is that what's been so innovative over the last 60 years? Really? Yet still, it seems men haven't changed enough to suit feminists. So, Crazy. so far, the innovative dialogue hasn't worked very well. It has not. And along those lines, I love this last part here that says, Freed from oppressive gender roles, people of Equaterra are not held back by dominant forms of masculinity, and they are happier and mentally healthier than any other society. Have you ever talked to a feminist you, <laughs> and, and gotten an assessment of their mental health as they're railing about the way some guy that they're not even next to sits on a bus that's their big social era uh, uh, or their big social concern of the time. That sounds mentally healthy to you, an obsession yeah. with the way people are sitting. Yeah. No. TIV. They're yeah. fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> TIV. And the TIV, last, exactly. The first thing yeah. that's going in there is boys will be boys. So they want to get rid of the idea that boys will be boys. Now, wait a minute. Last I checked, Boys are boys, so of course they will mm -hmm. be boys. Mm -hmm. The hell's well, wrong with that? Their mantra is boys will be girls. That's what they yeah. want, Paul. That's what the recycling is going to yeah. do. It's going to go mm -hmm. in there, and instead of boys wanting to be boys, they're going to want to be little girls. Because look yeah. at the little boxes on the other side. As the boxes come out of the recycling plant, what do you get? You get respect and inclusive language and no means no, <laughs> amongst other yeah. things. It's like, oh, man, you cannot make this stuff up, Paul. This would be a good, yeah. you can't make this shit up. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, yes, it would. you simply cannot make it up. It's crazy. Yeah. And it's all built, built around the total denial that there is biology. Right. And that it matters to how right. boys and girls develop into yes. men and women. And, of course, if we get more and more women graduating with degrees in biology and we get more and more feminists in control of the education system well maybe eventually biology will declare itself irrelevant and and will simply you know <laughs> prove that there is no such thing as biology i don't know i mean there that seems to be no one of the ends thing. oh yeah God. crazy 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 oh me should we go to the next one let's do the next one all right let's yeah. see what's on the next one nope. inclusion square Oh, boy. So there it is. Mm -hmm. square. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you've probably noticed by now is that almost everybody in Equaterra is a minority or they're gay or they're a mixed racial couple. 
Or they're in a wheelchair. <laughs> or they're in a wheelchair, or they're handicapped. Thank you. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yes, there have to be some of that. And I got to point out right here, I'm one thing I'm not buying. If you look at the oh. couple on the, the left, it <laughs> appears to be a dark-skinned female and a white-skinned male with dark hair. Yeah. There's a blonde oh. little boy there. That kid is not his. <laughs> it is. This should be Cuckold Avenue. Um, <laughs> Because I guess in Equaterra, men don't care if the child's actually theirs. They're just happy to help the woman with whoever she slept with. Paul, yeah. that's not inclusive language. I know, I know. <laughs> Send me back to the toxic masculinity. But again, you know, the blinders are so tight that the only people they're seeing are minorities or gays or handicapped people. It's like, no, the world's filled with quote normal people or just regular people let's say normal just regular it's like but they have something wrong with that you know mm -hmm. all yeah, three yeah, of yeah. us are part of white homos uh, white heterosexual couples yep. uh, yeah we don't exist i know and not, not only that we're the bad part but we can't move there which is a big relief to me <laughs> yeah well we're part of the problem you know we've exactly. had our place in the sun and we need to step aside and let other people take charge of our societies because we know they'll do a hell of a lot better job than we've done so far. Oh, boy. We need to step aside so things can be equal. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need to accept silence equality. and subordination. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Just a little bit of collective vengeance, you know, is sometimes is helpful when on, on this, in the struggle for equality. Yeah, it's uh, quite something. Yeah, it is something. this is uh, um, yeah, it's a and it's a place where, as Paul suggests, um, paternity fraud, parental alienation, uh, unjust divorce proceedings, false accusations, wrongful imprisonment, all those kinds of things that we talk about here uh, that uh, affect men in their regular lives none of those things exist they don't need to be dealt with there's absolutely no acknowledgement of those issues having to do with gender equality and so uh you know i mean until these people are willing to acknowledge things like the gendered fatal occupational fatality gap and the empathy gap in our world and the various other kinds of gaps that exist this is just a lie about what we need to do to make yep. our societies better. And it's a really it really dangerous one that such a powerful organization as the UN, the most you know powerful intergovernmental body in the whole world is putting this forward realistically, not for a laugh, not for you know a, like a, a kindergarten learning. I mean, it's so childish in the way it, it sets its, its vision forward Yes. And yet this is put forward in all seriousness as something that we have to accept as important and get on board with. Yes. I mean, I really, I can't get over it. I find it no. just terrifying. This is what happened when crazy feminist women are put in charge of envisioning the future. Yes. It is like something for kindergartners. Yes. It's crazy. And, and that, and speaking of that, I think the biggest tragedy here underlying all of this is the lack of critical thinking, the, the total absence of it. And I think this yeah. goes back, unfortunately, to father absence in many ways. Yes. Yeah. We have two generations now that have been raised more or less without fathers. And even though even the people whose fathers were at home were still part of the more or less fatherless generation where critical yeah. thinking is absolutely discouraged. That's how you come up with these fantastic, crazy ideas that could not ever materialize into anything real. And you will have millions of people nodding their heads up and down and say, oh yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And they have no idea how retarded they look doing this. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's, no. it's a tragedy. Yes, it really is. Yeah. And, and the waste of money and the waste of energy and the sacrifice in human productivity and human competence 
and just well-functioning societies as a result of attempts to put these various plans into action, it's astounding. And, and it's because, as you say, nobody has said no to these right. ideologues. Right, exactly. And that exactly. job of saying no, that is the masculine role. That's and right. men have either not been able to because they haven't been there or they've been disempowered or they've not been willing to because they've been told they mustn't say no. And this is what you get. You get a cartoon yeah. vision of what gender yeah. equality should be. Mm -hmm. And here at Regarding Men, we have put together something that's a much darker view a much less cartoonish view of gender equality and looks at just one aspect of how things are different. And that is the aspect of workplace gender equality. And let's have a look mm -hmm. at that just real quick. It's a little bit darker, but this is- Oh my, we've come back to reality, haven't we? Un mm -hmm. Yeah. Garbage men, antenna repair, sewage, cement, steel, pilots, loggers, farmers, commercial fishing, Truckers, firemen, construction workers, miners, and roofers. It's like all of these are usually 90 plus percent male. Yeah. What's it going to be in Equaterra? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, all of these occupations, which by the way are dangerous, most of them are dangerous, and most mm -hmm. of them cause more death, um, are mostly men. Yeah. And, and that, the... that is an interesting proposition because here you have all of these different professions in Equaterra, half of the positions for those will have to be filled by women. That means <laughs> we're going to have many, many women in body bags and coffins so, um, as a result of doing, doing those jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you having want equality. Physical... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, are, yes. are women are they interested in 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 the the physical discomfort of these jobs, the danger of these jobs, the lifelong disabilities that develop as a result of these jobs, just the dirt of it in their lives every day? There aren't very many women. There are some, sure, but not very many at all interested in, willing, or able to do this kind of work. Yep. And until that is a front and center part of discussions about so-called gender equality. It's just a lie and it's a really dangerous and disgusting anti-male fantasy. Yes. yes. And it should be called out and, every time. And if there really was an Equaterra, I mean, if we get down to the reality of that, they could create a country that, that operated with all this, these bullshit ideals and ideological goals still, on the other side of that, underneath where nobody looks, you would see men working and dying to support that society and keep it afloat. It would never happen without that that yes. going for it. Yes. And of right. course, they would yeah. they would walk around talking about how great things are in Equaterra and how people make you know the same money for the same work, and they would totally ignore the fact that the people that are in the death jobs and the death professions yeah. are dominantly male, and it'll stay yeah. that way because women are not going to do those jobs. We can no. talk till we're blue in the face, we can have all the ideals in the world, but you are not gonna see women in logging camps anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And you know, one of the limited capacities of this idea of Equaterra is that if you have Equaterra, you basically rid yourself of grief. You know, there's no more, there's nothing called grief anymore. And I think that's a part of this feminist dream is no more grief. But guess mm -hmm. what? You know, grief is really what make what brings maturity. If you don't have grief, you're not a mature human being. But they're trying to get rid of the very stuff that makes you mature and brings mm -hmm. you around to having compassion, having understanding of other people. You know, is that grief and they're trying to get rid of it crazy. Well, yeah, it's an inhuman vision. Yes. And, I mean, yes, exactly. I, I found that you know, I've even found that in the discussions that have gone on over the last year around COVID, it seems to me that a lot of it has to do with this unwillingness of our society. Like, it's like there's this outraged disbelief that people actually die before their time. It's it's like we've got to the point where we don't even want to accept that. Huh. Um, we don't want to accept the fact of death. It's, it's I don't know, I just, I find it is a very 
we're we're living in a society now that um, yeah it doesn't want any challenges of any right. sort, right. any pain, any sorrow, any anything, yeah. and that is quite inhuman. Yes, and it goes um, back but to but certain. Except, of course, unless it's men, you know, the, the, the pain and suffering and death of men is, <laughs> yeah. is, is perfectly acceptable to a lot of uh, feminist leaders and even, yeah. unfortunately, women who've been influenced by, by feminist attitudes. And, yeah, there is something really deeply immoral in not acknowledging the work and the attendant pain and deaths of men yes. that is necessary to the societies that that we've developed over Indeed. time it, it's wow yeah Indeed. amazing and i think this goes back to what paul said and that is fatherlessness is really at the root of this you know this fantasy you know as the father wasn't I believe there to that set the limits he wasn't there to say no you know no ice cream to eat your dick on broccoli you know he wasn't there to say that so they always got the ice cream no matter what Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's how we ended up with two generations of women that I swear, and it's, it's really unfortunate. You can take horse shit and put it in a bag and wrap a pink ribbon around it and say it's for women's empowerment. And women in this culture will line the hell up around the block to pay for it, either with their money or with their man's money. <laughs> and I mean, this is the kind of training women have had. Yeah. And it makes for, I think, a very dangerous mindsets in yeah, people i agree i agree are we finished i think we are yep i think we're nearly as finished as equaterra is oh man let's hope <laughs> that's true before it started. let's hope that's true bye bye equaterra what a <laughs> silly thing that is but it's, it's sad too you know it's just so mm -hmm. sad people could be that limited in their understanding of Men and yeah. Women. Oh yeah. well. Oh well. Oh well. What do we say? That, I will say that men are good. We did it pretty <laughs> well that time, I should say. <laughs> All righty. We mm -hmm. did it pretty yeah, well. Yeah, that only took us 94 tries. Yeah, let's see if we can turn <laughs> it off now. <laughs> Y'all take care. We'll see take you. Care. Bye, -bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.